This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening, I'm Anthony Germain. Thousands of dead farm salmon off of the south coast of Newfoundland and a massive cleanup is underway. Every available dive, te dive team rather, in this province has been hired. Plus, there are more from the Maritimes as well, four large vessels, all trying to scoop up every last fish before they rot. The fish belong to Northern Harvest Sea Farms. A company spokesperson says they've met with FFAW representatives in several communities, from Hermitage to Harbour Breton, English Harbour West to Ballorum and Rencounter East. Northern Harvest says warm water is to blame, but the Fish Harvesters Union says the whole incident raises questions about whether fish farms belong in the water at all. Uh, you know, fish harvesters have long been uh, speaking up about the impacts that uh, aquaculture can have on the wild fishery. They have suggested that maybe we should be looking at more land-based aquaculture development. So that's a conversation we need to start having here in the province as we continue to see these incidents um, at aquaculture facilities where uh, they're, you know, we're relying on that uh, marine environment to support our wild fishery. Now you can hear more of my interview with Jessica McCormick in about 20 minutes. And Fisheries Minister Jerry Byrne says the province is set to announce new regulations for fish farming tomorrow. And that's happening at an aquaculture industry conference in St. John's. And here and now we'll bring you all of the details. A lovely start to the day, depending on where you were. Certainly for the Avalon, sat around 14 degrees this morning. That temperature dropped through the day, though. Uh, otherwise, we do have temperatures pretty much in the teens across the board. Now we are starting to see some showers move in for the southwestern portion of the province. That's prompting uh, this low pressure system is prompting a wind warning for the Port of Basque area, uh, rather the Rec House area, where we're going to see gusts upwards of 100 kilometers per hour tonight. And then that same system bringing in uh, that chance of rain overnight, heavy at times. So we do have some rainfall warnings down along the south coast. I'll tell you how much is on the way and when it's going to end coming up. Not everybody who enters into the program is a Christian when they enter or when they leave. Later in the show, I'll tell you about a group that has faith in everyone's ability to overcome addiction. Coming up on Here and Now. The former head of the Newfoundland and Labrador Liquor Corporation is suing the province. The government fired Steve Winter last year, and he says he is owed more than $300,000. A statement of claim filed in court earlier this month says that Winter was fired without cause and that he's entitled to an additional year's salary and benefits because of his senior experience in his position. Winter held the role for more than 13 years and was critical of the government when he was suddenly let go. The NLC says it won't comment on the issue because it is now before the courts. Work at a massive construction project in Placentia Bay stopped briefly overnight. Union workers building the concrete gravity structure for the West White Rose extension are in a dispute with their employer about money. Husky Energy is the lead partner in the project. The work was subcontracted to a consortium including SNC-Lavalin, Dragados and Pentacon. Sources say the workers are owed several million dollars. A spokesperson for the consortium said there was some confusion over pay and the matter was resolved quickly. There are more than 2,000 people employed at the site. The Board of Trade hosted a debate today with three candidates in St. John's East. The main issue was cost of living. Here now's Terry Roberts reports. Of the seven federal seats up for grabs in this province, St. John's East is the one to watch. A liberal incumbent looking for his second term to repeat his electoral shocker from four years ago. A political heavyweight for the NDP looking to reclaim his seat in Ottawa and a newcomer to the federal scene trying to lead the Conservatives out of the political wilderness. The three debaters getting their final instructions at the Bella Vista. A small crowd, a lot on the line. As expected, the issue of affordability and taxation front and centre. We cannot afford any more taxes. We have stood up for lower business, uh, small business taxes. We saw that there was $2,000 more in people's pockets. But also questions about mental health supports, the province's shrinking population, 
immigration, and of course the future of oil and gas and the controversial Bill C-69. I'm not su suggesting that Bill C-69 is not open to amendment or change, but insofar as it recognizes the importance of having, uh, having an environmental uh, lens through which it, it operates, uh, our party would support it. This will see a new process where the environmental regulatory hurdles are largely cleared and new projects can be approved in a one to three month time frame similar to our international competitors. Uh, the Conservative Party of Canada has announced and Mr. Scheer has said they will repeal Bill C-69. Very little mention of climate change. Neither candidate said the words Muskrat Falls, the political experience of Whalen and Harris on full display. Wall held his own, but faces an uphill battle. Because we don't have all the answers, but we need to get them and from people like, from people like you and your profession. No clear winner, no major gaffes, no fireworks, mixed reviews from those in attendance, including from this longtime liberal who is shifting his vote. So I have my mind set on who I will be voting for this time, and I have a feeling that will be Mr. Wall. I will take time if I would decide my votes. So you're still not convinced yet? Not yet. And one more thing missing here today, Green Party candidate David Peters. He was working and couldn't attend. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, we're getting our first look at a new addiction center for women. A group called Teen Challenge Canada opened the center on the outskirts of St. John's earlier this year. Well, clients have to pay $1,000 to join the program, but the group says 95% of its money comes from donors. Here now is Mark Quinn takes you along now for this tour. So at eight years old is when I had my first drink. And um, by the time I was a teenager, I was using a variety of drugs on a regular basis. Before I reached the age of 30, I had become an intravenous drug user and could not really function too well without a needle. Tracy Whalen knows how this program works firsthand. In 2010, she became a resident at a teen challenge facility like this in Ontario. I needed a lot more than a short-term program to help me to learn how to live again and to learn how to live without using substances. This 12-month program has what its leaders call a spiritual component, and that's obvious throughout these buildings. We are a Christian faith-based program. Uh, we make it clear from the outset, but all that we require of students is that they're open to uh, a program that is based on, uh, is faith-based and, and in our case, it's a Christian program. But its leaders say treating addictions, not creating Christians, is their focus. They say you don't have to be religious to get in, and you don't have to become religious to stay. Uh, well, that's a personal decision that each one of them would make through the course of the program. Uh, it's not required to graduate. This program started in July, and there are fewer than half a dozen residents here now. But the goal is to have up to 25 residents here in the future. Our program is all about drug and alcohol rehabilitation. We're off to a great start. Teen Challenge says 50 to 60 percent of people who graduate aren't abusing substances five years after they leave. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. The Johnson Geo Centre has a new owner. The Signal Hill attraction has been given to Memorial University. It is the largest single gift the university has ever received. The Johnson family estate first approached Munn back in 2016 about taking over the centre and Memorial accepted on the condition that the building be run on a cost-neutral basis. The Johnson Geo Centre is estimated to be worth more than $20 million and it draws about 50,000 visitors every year. The Johnson family says it hopes that the university will help take the Geo Centre to another level. When you put a display of rocks in, they don't move unless you've got some kids picking them up. But, I mean, a static uh, display like this, you have to do something to make it exciting for everybody who comes in. And so uh, MUN was the next step to take it to another educational level and an excitement level for all the people who come here. Well, this Friday, people around the world will be marching in support of the global climate strike. And in St. John's, preparations now underway. Carolyn Stokes is live at St. Michael's Print Shop in downtown St. John's for a climate strike art pop-up. So, Carolyn, what's, what's this all about? Yes, uh, 
<laughs> well, Anthony, you know all of those signs and banners that people are holding up during all of those global marches. Well, someone has to make them all, and that's what's happening here tonight at St. Michael's Print Shop. It's in preparation for the global climate strike that's happening in St. John's this Friday morning. And joining me to speak more about that is uh, Rachel Jekinowski. You're with the Social Justice Group, the co-op yeah, yeah. in Newfoundland and Labrador. You organize this event, but this is about more than just putting together bristle board and paint. Uh, you're trying to get people to come together on this. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, we wanted to use this as an opportunity to mobilize, to create a space that people could come together, find out more about the climate strike, which is on Friday, of course, uh, and then also create something to bring with them and hopefully bring home. Uh, the co-op has been working to um, mobilize, build a coalition of community members, uh, business owners, students, uh, faculty members, people who work at the university like myself. Uh, but we thought, how do we make spaces to bring people together? And everyone loves to come together over paint. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, Bristol board. So that's what we're here today to do. Okay, you have quite a few people uh, back there. So this is kind of an example of some of the signs that you're putting together. Uh, do you want to read that out? Sure. It says, if climate was a bank, we would have saved it by now. And we're really trying to think about uh, the action uh, after, of course, the global financial crash. You had governments pitch in, bail out banks. Um, more effort has been um, uh, exerted around preserving the system quo, right? But here we're trying to promote uh, action on climate change. So it's climate change, uh, you know, requires system change. And you're a young person. Uh, why is climate change such an important issue for you personally? Uh, personally, I mean, I'm I'm only 30, so given the recommendations of uh, all of the climate scientists, we only have about 15 years, uh, maybe 11 years to act on it. So uh, I'm going to be in my 40s, right? And that's that's a terrifying thought. So rather than wait for someone else to create change, we're trying to do it here together. Okay. And I have another guest here with me, Erin uh, Lee. You're with uh, Fridays for Futures, and this is the group that's actually organizing the march that's happening on Friday. What are your hopes uh, for this march? Do you, do you hope that this action will actually change the minds of people and industry around the world? Um, well, we hope, we really do hope so. Um, we have two specific asks for this event, so we are actually asking for the City of St. John's as well as the Providence of Newfoundland and Labrador to declare a climate emergency. And we are also asking for the determination of offshore oil exploration and subsidies. So we're hoping that the government listens to us because we're certainly watching them. Right, and, and tell us more about the march because this will end on the steps of Confederation Building right at the feet of government. Yes, so we'll be meeting at the Munn Clock Tower at 11 a.m and then we'll be walking up to the Confederation Building in Solidarity together and we'll get there around 12 o'clock and we'll have speeches from politicians and from the unions and we'll have performances and activities and it's just going to be a really great event for everyone to come out to. It's an all ages event so it started off as a school climate strike but now it's a general strike. We need everyone. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Erin. And of course, the environment is on the minds of all the people uh, here in this room, but it was also on the minds of some St. John City councillors uh, last night at the council meeting when they held a vote uh, to approve two new drive throughs in the parking lot of the Avalon Mall. And uh, there are some environmental concerns around that, things about uh, cars idling and emissions in the atmosphere. So uh, coming up a little bit later, I'm going to speak with uh, Mayor Danny Breen and Deputy Mayor uh, Sheila O'Leary about uh, what they think about that issue. Reporting live from St. Michael's Print Shop in downtown St. John's, I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now.
Well, the morning was kind of pretty good, I guess, not to be glowing too much, but in that day kind of, at least here in St. John, sort of slid away into less pleasant conditions. Yeah, it certainly did. I went for a walk this morning uh, on Signal Hill, and by the time I went back to go down it, uh, the winds had it shifted changed, already, yeah. and the temperatures were dipping. So, uh, I mean, welcome for me as I was working out, but sure. uh, not so much for other people. If you take a look at the temperatures that we sat this, or where we were sitting this morning was 14 degrees and reached a high near 19 in Corner Brook today. Those temperatures up through Labrador still kind of chilly. 10 degrees in Lab City, uh, 9 in Makovic this afternoon. Now I mentioned that temperature drop 7 degrees currently in St. John's, 8 in Bonavista, uh, dropped down to 14 degrees for Corner Brook and Happy Valley Goose Bay is currently sitting at 11 degrees and again that northerly wind. So uh, generally, uh, currently sustained winds about 20, maybe 30 kilometers per hour. Those winds will stay uh, quite strong as we head through the night tonight. And uh, pretty, and those winds will ease on the west coast, except down uh, along the southeast coast, and that's be or southwest coast rather. And that's because the next system is moving in. So we do have some rain already uh, making its way towards the uh, Clarenville area and Bonavista area. And that will continue as we head through the night tonight. So this model is actually doing really well as far as that timing goes. We're going to see that rain move in a little bit further north as we head through the morning, early morning hours. After midnight is when we should start to see those showers for the metro area. And then that will continue to track a little bit further north. Now we could see some of this rain heavy at times. And again, because of these easterlies here, we do have a uh, wreck house wind warning in effect or Environment Canada does and then uh, rainfall warnings for the rest of the south coast. And as of tonight, we could see somewhere between 10 to 20 millimeters of rain and even the potential for some thunderstorms uh, might stay offshore, but still have that risk in there. Nonetheless, 11 degrees for Port of Basque overnight tonight, eight for Marystown. Going to dip down one or two more degrees for St. John's going down to about six degrees. And then again, those winds 20 to 40 kilometers per hour should see uh, clear skies for the most part for the northern peninsula. You're not going to see that rain move in until tomorrow afternoon and then a cold but clear night for Labrador. Uh, pretty calm minus two for Lab City with those winds easing four degrees for Nain and one for Happy Valley Goose Bay. So here's what we're looking at as far as tomorrow goes. That rain sticks with us. We're going to see some heavier rain move in again along the south coast and then the Avalon and then continue to spread a little bit further nor north through the day. Eventually start to see some cloud cover and that uh, chance of some rain for Labrador as well. But again, that won't happen till the evening hours. So this is what we're expecting as far as rainfall goes. About 10 to 20 millimeters of rain by tomorrow morning. And then the heavier rain moves in and we could see uh, widespread areas of between 30 to 50 millimeters of rain. Even the south coast could see upwards of about 60 millimeters of rain. So even though we'd only have rainfall warnings along the south coast, anticipating that those will move further north as we head through uh, probably the next forecast period. Uh, 14 degrees tomorrow for Placentia, 11 in St. John's. Those winds shifting to southeasterlies. 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Going to stay in those single digits for Grand Falls, Windsor with that rain. Twilling gate 8 degrees, a little bit warmer along the west coast uh, with easterly winds 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. You won't see that rain until later on in the day, as I mentioned, for the northern peninsula. 7 degrees for uh, St. Anthony. But overall, we're looking at sunshine for the first half of the day anyway for Labrador. Beautiful afternoon for Lab City, 12 degrees. 12 for Happy Valley Goose Bay as well. You'll see that rain move in overnight. Thanks, Ashley. Raw sewage flows from homes in Fort Amherst straight into the ocean. But three years ago, the city of St. John's approved a $6 million fix for that. And yet the work still isn't done. Well, the mayor says the city has hit a snag with the Port Authority. Here now, Cease Hair reports. Picturesque Fort Amherst, like something from a tourism ad. Charming and quaint houses built into the side of the hill by families that have been around for generations. But all that glitters is not gold. A St. John City Councilor has gone so far to say there's something foul in the air. The waste from people's sinks and toilets flow from Fort Amherst into the environment. This pipe here provides a line to about 20 houses further up the hill. In all, there are three pipes that have untreated household waste flowing into the ocean at Fort Amherst. The homes were never hooked up to the waste treatment plant two kilometers away when it opened about a decade ago. Mark Hiscock and his family have been in the fort for decades. 
visually this beautiful little park here and and you know tourists coming down and and residents of St. John's or whoever and and that's what you're looking at there but uh, I'd, I'd certainly hope that the, the city and the port can come to some cooperation and, and get it done. Hiscock is talking about a plan on the books that would fix this problem. The city of St. John's has a plan to build a new lift station to redirect waste from the ocean to the water treatment plant. It even has six million dollars set aside to do the work, but first it needs to take ownership of some land which currently belongs to the Port Authority. And Mayor Danny Breen says that's where the problem begins. We have all the design done, we have all the preparation work done, but unfortunately we can't reach an agreement with the Port Authority on the uh, on, on the land there. So uh, uh, we don't have, or we're, we, we can't reach an agreement on taking over the land that we need to do the work on. So that's where we're stalled. The city now has an environmental report on Southside Road leading to the plant that considers potential liabilities while doing the work. It doesn't want to take ownership of the road without knowing what's underground first. And for its part, the Port Authority says it's waiting to see what's in the report. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Well, science has let us find ways to keep fish in tanks to provide food for years now, but it doesn't always work. Looks like a significant incident has happened on the south coast with tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of dead salmon. What's happening? Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Here and Now. You are looking at some fish in their more or less natural environment at the Fluvarium here in St. John's, but on the south coast there's been some kind of incident with what we believe is a large number of dead fish. It has to do with aquaculture. And joining me now is Jessica McCormick with FFAW. What do we know so far about this incident involving uh, this company? So what we know is uh, at the Northern Harvest Sea Farms uh, aquaculture facility on the south coast of the province, uh, there, were, uh, there was a significant uh, mortality of, of salmon. Uh, so they have uh, some open net pen uh, farming happening there. And there's been you know, a significant number of salmon um, that have died as a result of what the company is uh, referring to as climate change, warming water temperatures. FFAW has been hearing from our members over the past few weeks who uh, fish in that area who are concerned about uh, the impact that the mortalities might have on the marine environment. Right now we don't actually know a number because the company says it has statistics but hasn't really been explicit with a fixed number. However, the company does say that it's got every dive team in Newfoundland Labrador. It's brought in divers from New Brunswick. There are three purse seines involved. What, what does that tell you? Well, I would venture to guess that the number of mortalities would be in the hundreds of thousands. So a significant number uh, of, uh, of dead salmon in the area. And, you know, fish harvesters have long raised concerns about the impacts of aquaculture on the marine environment. They rely on the pristine e ecosystem uh, to harvest uh, fish through the wild fishery. So any uh, type of incident on the water that could uh, impact uh, their uh, wild fish is a major concern for harvesters. Now, the company also says that it's tried to uh, be a good corporate citizen that's been in touch with the FFAW about this. Do we know for certain that this is climate change related? That it's, because the company says because the water got cold all of a sudden? Does that seem plausible? Well, uh, you know, the company has said that it, that it is a result of warming water temperatures. Uh, you know, we've heard of other incidents at aquaculture facilities in the past where sea lice have been a concern, where uh, salmon have escaped from the pens. Uh, so there are a number of issues that arise uh, from aquaculture development. The company is pointing to a water temperature on this one, um, but it certainly leads fish harvesters to question what could happen in other uh, aquaculture development sites uh, that are beginning to pop up around the province. The other thing that we often hear in these kinds of incidents, the company saying this poses no threat to humans. But if we're talking about a lot of dead fish stuck in these pens, they got divers scooping out these dead fish and trucking them away somewhere. Uh, is there any kind of health concern with respect to the ecology that the FA, FFAW is concerned about? Well, uh, harvesters are concerned with the pace of removals. There are, you know, as I said, uh, many, many uh, dead fish in the water. It's going to take time to remove those uh, from the pens, potentially weeks. Uh, so as the fish decompose, there could be, um, you know, uh, different, uh, you know, issues with the, the water. Uh, the company has reassured us that the, that shouldn't impact, um, you know, say lobster in the area. But in the past, uh, when we've had large mortalities like this, uh, at aquaculture sites, there have been some uh, impacts on, for example, lobster, uh, and that kind of that species really thrives in, in that area. So that's something that we're worried about. We're hoping that um, that doesn't prove to be true, but we'll be looking to continue to talk to the company and uh, and see how this process right. unfolds. Right, and keep your eyes on what's going on until we actually get a final number to get a sense yeah. of what the scope is. One last question for you, Jessica, as you know. Uh, Newfoundland has, you know, is banking on aquaculture, uh, particularly with the Greig project which is coming. Do incidents like these raise any questions as Newfoundland Labrador decides to really double down on aquaculture? Well, just a few weeks ago, uh, we heard of a, an approval for the uh, Greek site um, on the next door in Placentia Bay, and so our members in that area are obviously concerned. Uh, you know, fish harvesters have long been uh, speaking up about the impacts that uh, aquaculture can have on the wild fishery. They have suggested that maybe we should be looking at more land-based aquaculture development. So that's a conversation we need to start having here in the province as we continue to see these incidents um, at aquaculture facilities where uh, they're, you know, we're relying on that. Uh, marine environment to support right. our wild fishery. Okay, and this incident, this story developing just as a major conference is about to start in St. John's uh, for the aquaculture industry. Um, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. So as you just heard, uh, the environment, warming temperatures, perhaps the cause of all of these dead salmon. The climate change issue has been very big on here and now, very big around the world. And there is an event in downtown St. John's right now that is related to this, Carolyn Stokes. 
Thanks so much, Anthony. Uh, yes, uh, the global climate change strike that's happening on Friday is on the minds of the people here uh, tonight. I'm at li uh, live at St. Michael's Print Shop in downtown St. John's, where folks are busy preparing for Friday's global strike that's happening in St. John's. Now, environmental issues are also on the minds of city councilors in St. John's. Last night, council voted in favor of allowing two drive throughs to be constructed in the parking lot of the Avalon Mall. One is a bank machine drive through Another is a fast food drive through But not all counselor, counselors uh, supported the motion in part uh, because of the damage idling cars do to the environment. Dozens of municipalities across the country have banned or partially banned drive throughs So we heard from Mayor Danny Breen last night who's in favor of the drive throughs And today we heard from Deputy Mayor Sheila Larry, who voted against it. Here's what they had to say. This is not in a residential area. It's in the corner of the, uh, just about in the corner of the of the mall parking lot. It won't interfere any backup. Uh, wouldn't be interfering with traffic or anything. And uh, you know, if if you're if, if you're looking at it from a food supply pers perspective, I mean, I think the people driving the cars are usually parents and adults, and so they're making their decisions on their on their on their food choices there. So if you want to uh, look at the impacts in terms of idling and that, that's that's really uh, um, an, an important issue and uh, one that we can look at what's happening across Canada and see if there's, uh, um, see what council wants to do it in, in the long term. But, you know, these drive throughs are utilized by a lot of people and it's, uh, uh, and, and it's a choice of the public to be, to be utilizing them. I, I do give thought to uh, them in residential areas and close to residential areas, um, but I haven't given any thought to an outright ban of, uh, of drive throughs The times are changing and uh, we are seeing practices certainly in other municipalities uh, where um, cities and towns you know across North America are starting to look at this because it is really negatively impacting people not only from a transportation and buffering issue but also just from a climate change issue and we need to start thinking about every single component of our development how it impacts climate action in our communities. It does tie in with the whole uh, climate action movement that's happening globally, but we need to boil it down and see how can we as a municipality start making changes that make a difference. So do we need more drive throughs Do we need uh, a drive through uh, for a banking machine? Is that something that's a necessity? I know that we need to continue to convenience ourselves as a society, but the bottom line is that we have to do things within our own control, within our municipality, that actually helps the environment. Now, the deputy mayor told me that she will definitely be attending the global uh, climate strike march that's happening on Friday in St. John's, along with all of the people here behind me at St. Michael's Print Shop in downtown St. John's. So uh, if you are interested in going to that uh, event on Friday, it's happening at 11 a.m. at the Munns Clock Tower, and then everyone's going to march up to Confederation Hill where there will be some speeches and all that sort of this stuff. So reporting live from downtown St. John's, I'm Carolyn Stokes for here now. 100 years ago, if you were standing on this very spot, then a streetcar would come clattering by every 10 minutes. It's a story lovingly told in a new book, Streetcars of St. John's. We've got the story for you coming up.
Welcome back to Here Now. Something for you many lovers of Newfoundland history now. It was ahead of its time and it was always on time. And now a new book brings St. John's old streetcars back to life. And the author does that by taking you on a journey through time all along the original route. Here now, Zach Gowdy takes you aboard. Long before cars ruled the road, the streets of St. John's were alive with the hustle and bustle of businesses, horses and carts, and especially the streetcar. For nearly half a century, it was the best way to get around the city. Tracks ring the downtown from Water Street to La Marchant Road. If you missed one, another streetcar would be along promptly in just 10 minutes. Today, those same streets are abuzz with cars and buses, trucks and motorcycles. But author Kenneth Piraway still sees the black and white world of the streetcar. I've looked at these images so often, they're literally seared into my mind, hey? So there's times I can almost visualize a streetcar coming down Water Street. It's a vision captured in Piraway's new book, Streetcars of St. John's. Through words and pictures, it tells the story of how a small city built a world-class transit system. We built our streetcar system at the same time as San Francisco, Boston, New York, Vancouver, Toronto, uh, Montreal, Chicago. All these great cities in North America. In 1900, St. John's was on par with those cities. On May 1st, 1900, with a new century dawning, the city's first streetcar clattered down the freshly laid tracks. So literally hundreds of people, little children, old, young and light, came out to see this new form of transportation. And it, it was marvelous, it was wonderful. Citizens had not seen the like of it before. I mean, the streetcar was just fascinating. It's the only word I can come to mind. It's a feeling that Sally Kelly remembers well. As a little girl, she would ride the streetcar on trips to the city, a story she shares in Piraway's book. It was a thrill, just a thrill to know that I'm on one of these machines. You had to get up those high steps. For me, it was like climbing a mountain. And then you were lucky when you got a seat. I didn't want to get off, I can tell you that. You know, and then you got to see so much of St. John's which made it all the more interesting for me. Piraway wanted readers to see the old city too and to marvel at how much has changed. His book places historic photos of the streetcar system side by side with his own photos of the same locations. His retakes are painstakingly done down to the last detail. I actually took the original picture, well, a little small copy of it, and I would stand precisely as best I could on the exact spot where that original shot was taken. It really sounds like the whole thing was a labor of love for you, Ken. Uh, I would describe it as a labor of love without the labor, because it was fun. The streetcars ran until 1948, the year before Confederation. By then, the city had outgrown the system, and expanding it was deemed too expensive. But a few years later, a successor to the streetcar appeared. Metrobus exists directly today because of our streetcar system. Of course, public transit had to continue in some way, shape or form. So buses were brought in after the streetcar system, but then Metrobus itself was formed in 1957 and it still exists to this day. Some of the streetcar track still exists too, buried under the pavement. But sometimes road work will uncover a few rails and remind us of what used to be. Streetcars of St. John's is both a record of and tribute to a fascinating chapter in local history. Piraway says he didn't write it for the money. In fact, he's donating his royalties from the book to cancer research. Rather, he did it to tell a story that was too good to stay buried. A story that gives you a new way to see the city, just like a ride on the streetcar. Many of the original scenes that are in my book show places, pieces, parts of St. John's that still exist. So it's worth coming here. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Some beautiful editing there, now and then, on Here and Now. Well, Canada's favorite basketball team, the Raptors, is famous for more than just winning the NBA title earlier this year. The team's general manager has set up training camps, and they are training camps set up in Africa. And it's the kind of support that helps young talent develop. And here's a look at what Adrienne Arsenault found during her visit.
Don on the beach in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, oddly enough, this is a pretty good place to be if you want to have a conversation about the opportunity basketball presents in this country. Why here? Well, this is where every morning a big man who's a very big deal in this country works out. I'm not kidding when I refer to my friend Hashim Tabib as a big man. Hashim, you are seven foot? Seven foot three. Okay, so we're twins. So, sort of, sort of. Ba Depends on how you look at it. Yeah, well, that's how I look at it. Listen, you... Um, one of the top 25 tallest players ever to play in the NBA. Correct. The only player from Tanzania. East Africa in general. What, what would your life have been like without basketball? Man, it would been tough. Um, especially, you know, um, when I was starting to uh, play basketball, it was around the time my dad just passed. So, you know, I, I, I had no idea how I was going to go to school. And, you know, through sports, I was able to go and get education and become who I am today. You know, that th those sorts of opportunities that the right. sport can provide, because you, you went to college be because of it, is what has brought uh, the Toronto Raptors president, Masai Ujiri, correct, here correct. to the continent. He has been, he created a, this program called the Giants of Africa, which basically tries to teach kids that there are opportunities for them uh, that the sport can present that doesn't have to mean playing in the NBA. It can mean working in sports. So he, he takes these camps all over the continent, Rwanda, Somalia, South Sudan, here in Tanzania. You were at the camp, the kids were all over you. Correct. This isn't a country in conflict, you know, it isn't a country of extreme poverty, but why does it still need a camp like that? Yeah, uh, definitely a beautiful country. Uh, it's just a matter of exposure, you know, exposure and opportunities. You know, these kids need a role model to see, like, this guy is actually from here. He can get it done. So, you know, through this sport, you know, opportunity they have, they could get a free education. They could become doctors, lawyers, whatever they want to do. But, uh, you know, it, it goes, you know, together, basketball and school. So, you know, just work hard. You know, everything is possible. Okay, well, you have to work especially hard. You're a free agent. Good. I know you're, yeah. you're still yeah. trying to get in. Yeah. Listen, enjoy your workout. That message that Hashim just offered here is exactly what Ujiri wants the kids to hear, that there is a path for them. And his passion for this continent is what drives a man who otherwise could be taking a break, fresh off the heels of that NBA championship victory. He's not pulling up a chair on a dock. He's right here. Adrian Arsenal, CBC News, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania.
Okay, so we looked at today, mm -hmm. and let's take a look at what's coming up now. Yeah, we're looking midweek. at midweek, yeah, hump day, Wednesday afternoon. Uh, we are looking at some more rain on the way and uh, heavy at times. So we'll take a look at the forecast. These temperatures, cool temperatures are going to stick around 11 degrees for uh, St. John's. And then those winds out of the east southeast 30 to 50 kilometers per hour, a little bit uh, less along the west coast, about 40 kilometers per hour, but still breezy through the day with uh, that heavy rain moving in as well. Now up through Labrador, you're going to sit out of this for the first half of the day anyway. Uh, we're looking at plenty of sunshine and then some showers and uh, or cloud cover and showers will move in late day. 12 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay, same for Lab City and Nain should sit around 13 degrees. McCovic 14 with those winds shifting from southwesterly to southeasterly uh, around 20 kilometers per hour. So still quite light through the day. Now I mentioned that rainfall. Here's what we're expecting into Thursday after or Thursday morning anyway. As of now, we're looking at between 30 to 50, even 60 millimeters of rain down through the south coast. Now, because this is uh, tropical uh, moisture, there is a chance that we could see even more rain. So we're gonna, definitely going to have to pay attention to uh, what the models are going to say through the day tomorrow. But this is uh, what we're looking at as of now. We do have those rainfall warnings along the south coast. So here's uh, tomorrow night. And then that will continue to track a little bit further north. Again, you can see some of that heavy rain into tomorrow or rather on Thursday morning, things should taper to showers before that moves off into the afternoon, but it will stay cloudy through the day on Thursday. And then up through Labrador, we're looking at some more showers moving in for Lab City with some cloud cover essentially across the board through the day on Thursday. That rain will continue to track towards uh, the coast into the evening and overnight hours, and we'll see another round of rain move in for the west coast. So over the next uh, couple of days, we are looking at temperatures finally climbing. So 15 degrees by Thursday again with that rain, 17 for Corner Brook on, uh, on Thursday as well. 12 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Nain going to sit around 9 degrees again with those showers moving in through the day. And we're really going to stay in the teen temperatures through the next couple of days. So here's what we're looking at for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. By Friday, we should see the sun peak out. Saturday, slight chance of showers and 17 degrees. And then Sunday, we're looking at sunshine at this point and 15 degrees. Now for central, essentially uh, some showers will continue through Friday. The sun will eventually peak out, at least it looks like as of now. Saturday, 17 degrees and then staying uh, with a little bit of sunshine on Sunday, but still can't rule out that chance of some showers moving in. 15 degrees for you. And then for Western Newfoundland, 12 to 17. So a big jump in those temperatures as we head into Thursday. You're going to stay there through Friday and then uh, sunshine on Saturday and 14 degrees. Now for Labrador, you're looking at sunshine tomorrow and then it looks unsettled through essentially the entire weekend, but those temperatures are going to stay pretty uh, similar. So anywhere from 12 to 14 degrees with overnight lows dipping into the single digits. And then for Western Labrador, sunshine tomorrow. And then again, some gray skies and cooler temperatures by Friday back to the single digits and overnight lows dipping into the minus single digits. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo when I come back. In other news, the wife of celebrity businessman Kevin O'Leary has been charged in connection with a boat crash that left two people dead and three others injured last month. Linda O'Leary is one of two people charged in that incident. Linda O'Leary faces a charge of careless operation of a vessel. The crash happened on Lake Joseph, north of Toronto, and involved two boats. A 64-year-old man from Florida died at the scene, and a 48-year-old woman from Uxbridge, Ontario, died in hospital a few days later. A man from New York who was on the other boat has also been charged, and he faces a charge of failing to exhibit a navigation light. O'Leary is scheduled to appear in court next month. For the Liberals and NDP, day 14 of the federal election campaign has been all about the environment. The NDP's Jagmeet Singh was in Winnipeg to announce what he calls a new deal for climate action and good jobs. We're talking about three specific commitments to electrify transportation, ending fossil fuel subsidies, ensuring that Indigenous communities are equal partners in decision making on the front lines, and making sure we have a climate bank in place that increases investments in reducing our emissions, connecting energy that's clean across Canada. These are our commitments today. We know we can achieve them. Now, Justin Trudeau was in Singh's BC riding outlining the Liberal Party's climate plan. He pledged to commit to net zero fossil fuel emissions by 2050 
if reelected. And in New Brunswick, the Green Party's Elizabeth May unveiled her plan to bring more services to rural communities. They would include public transit, banking, and free high-speed internet in post offices. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer was in southern Ontario, and he promised to repeal changes to a small business tax that made it harder for companies to pay dividends to family members. All right, to an animal story now. If you've ever lost a pet, this is something that you'll be able to relate to. A young man recently drove hundreds of kilometers to Manitoba to be reunited with his beloved pet, who had gone missing four years earlier. CBC's Marjorie Dahos has more on this very emotional reunion. Mike Platt never thought this moment would happen. As soon as I seen him, yeah, I kind of, I, I broke down. And he broke down, started crying, and it was something, that's for sure. Plus, drove over 600 kilometers from Thunder Bay to Winnipeg after getting a call on Thursday. An employee at a Winnipeg animal shelter delivered the good news. They found his dog who went missing years ago. Thursday at work, 2.30ish or whatever, I got a call and asked for my name and if I had a dog named Jack and then I told them that I'd lost him four years ago and they, oh, they kind of, oh wow, I'm pretty sure we have him. Jack, sit, sit, high five. Plas says the Husky Shepherd mix disappeared while staying at his dad's house. He says Jack was always good at coming back home, and when he didn't come back, Plas feared the worst. He had a perimeter that he could stay within, and he got his collar off, and he took off, and we had lots of wolves around where I lived, so I figured, okay, well, the wolves got him. But then, I don't know, every time I'd be around dad's, just driving by, because he went to a couple houses a couple times, but he always came home and just had a feeling it wasn't gone. Plus says Jack is more than just a pet, having adopted him as a puppy from a Thunder Bay animal shelter. Well, I've always called him my brother. He's definitely my brother. He's my best friend. I knew he was going to remember me, it was, and it was nice to see like he was crying too, and so he was really happy, and I was happy to see that. He's, I knew he was going to remember me. Plus says animal hospital staff told him they were able to reunite the two thanks to Jack's microchip. He says that now that his brother is back with him, he might have to bring him to work to make sure he doesn't go missing again. I don't know, I think everything eventually will go back to normal. I don't know, it's kind of hard for me to take my eyes off him right now. I just can't believe he's still here. Okay, come on, buddy. One more trip. Marjorie Dowhouse, CBC News, Winnipeg. Come here, Jacko. Well, we want to know where you're to. This photo, beautiful, mm. kind of eerie, but uh, gorgeous, foggy shot there. Uh, Frank Walter sent us that photo. I'll tell you where it's taken when we come back.
Okay, so should we get right to that beautiful photo? I think so. I want to take a better look because it's uh, very stylish. It's super stylish. This was uh, taken in, uh, what, 1957? <laughs> it what? certainly looks like it, doesn't it? Yeah, a little bit of a, a grayscale uh, work on that. This photo was actually taken in Porta Beautiful Porta Yes. And a nice effect, too. And the beautiful effect. I mean, I'm sure I haven't, have we, well, we've had some pictures from there, but not quite, uh, not a lot of them. So I'm assuming that what's behind that fog is absolutely mm -hmm. gorgeous. But yeah, Frank Walter sent us that photo. Thank you so much for sending it in. And uh, if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Gray, foggy day in port Thanks, Frank. <laughs> Great pick. Mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow is a big uh, aquaculture conference opening at St. John's. Minister of Fisheries uh, Jerry Byrne is going to announce some new regulations for that industry. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we'll be following whatever it is that's going on on the south coast, try to get a better sense of what's actually unfolding there. So uh, we'll try to bring you all of those details and uh, more weather and news and everything else you need tomorrow on that's Here right. I Am. <laughs> See you then. Good night. Yeah, you could... Uh,